Are there men who look at you like you're fierce? Uh, I like to think so, and it brings me such joy because my goal really? is to be feared. I want men to fear me. Why? Yes. Why? Because it changes the way they interact with you. Mm-hmm. It changes the level of nonsense that comes to you. Live with Simon Chris Makanga. Thank you so much for the good comments and uh, the subscription and the likes. My guest tonight is a young lady, a social worker, a mentor, and a proud feminist. Alessi Maria. Hi, Chris. I don't know if I'm young, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm yes. defining you by the look on the face. Okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but yes. I don't know how people will judge what you say. But as for me, I know mm-hmm. you as one of the most intelligent ladies. Oh, thank mm-hmm. you very much. Maria has shared a platform with one of the big brains in this land. So expect a lot of information and it's going to be a good conversation. Maria, yes. most people define you as a strong feminist. Mm-hmm. What is feminism? Huh. Feminism is um, is an ideology. It is a practice. Um, it's a school of thought. So people define it differently, but central to it, it's an, ideo- an ideology, a school of thought, a practice that um, seeks for the political, social, and economic equality of all persons, but with its primary focus on women and other people pushed to the margins of society. Yes, so that's what it is. So who was Maria before you became all that that you just explained? <laughs> who was Maria before I became all this? I think I was just, um, I was first a human being. Of course, I'm still a human being. I was first a human being. Um, I grew up in Ntinda, Analia. Um, I went to school and I've lived in Uganda all my life before people assume I went outside countries and returned. To get a good accent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dead. Hey. The accent came from listening to BBC as a child. Mm. So I, I don't know what like before all this would look like, but I think like I've always been a person um, who is interested in the lives of people, but also who is curious. I think for me, that's like my favorite trait. Like I'm curious about things. I've always been curious about things. Like I want to know why people do things. I want to know why society is organized a certain way. I want to understand why, like, why do these rules exist? Yeah. So for me, that's what I'll define myself as then, but also now subscribing to feminism as an ideology, but also as a political position for me, because feminism is actually also like a political stance Mm. on many things. Yeah. How long have you been doing this? How long have I been a feminist? Hmm. Maybe eight, nine years. Yes, eight or nine. There. So it's are a there journey. pushing factors that yes. must have mm. led you to, to becoming a feminist like you are? What yeah. are those factors? Yes, so for me, it was really just coming across knowledge and information, right? So we are all molded a certain way when we are growing. We grew up in a society where um, often, on top of all the other things they ask you to aspire for, they ask you to aspire to be a wife if you're a woman. Um, they aspire for you. They, they they create aspirations for you to want family, to want um, to be subservient in society. So the definition of a good woman, like a good woman is that nice, obedient, quiet, um, loving, present person who does not challenge things, right? Like I'm told something and I go with it. So for me, curiosity and this i guess also comes with work because like when i came into the work of world like you mentioned earlier i'm a social worker and through my social work my first the the beginning of my career i worked with young people um and specifically young people who are in political spaces and policy spaces and so in when you're doing research on these things there's information you come across when you're learning new things you learn um when you're trying to like review policies when you're trying to understand the way society is structured and why certain things happen then you 
you were going to do research and so when i came across this information i came across information about feminism um one reading the works of dr sylvia professor sylvia tamale sorry um interacting with women like dr hilda tadria these are women who have been very uh, cr critical in the work of the women's movement in uganda largely so for me that is where i came across like feminism as a school of thought and so reading and learning and now seeing how certain things play out mm. in life on a daily because feminism doesn't come out of the blue it's deeply rooted in the experiences of women um across the world and so for me that information led me to take on this political identity and as you a talked feminist. about the experiences mm. what are some of those experiences so some of those experiences include things like gender-based violence. Mm. Some of them include things like sexual harassment in workplaces, uh, discrimination simply on the grounds that you're a woman, appreciating like when you learn history, you come to appreciate that there was a season when women couldn't open a bank account. Mm. They couldn't own a business by themselves. Um, today, even if you wanted to access in certain spaces, if you want to access um, contraception, they're going to ask you about your male partner. Um, the fact that women couldn't inherit property for a very long time because they were property so it was they passed you down i know um you're, you're married in church there's that there's that um ritual or ceremony that mm. happens when the bride has walked down the aisle then they'll say who presents her to be married mm. and then either her brother or her, her uncle or father will mm. get up and present her hand to the priest who mm. then presents it to you but nobody does the other way around mm. for a man which sort of implies which implies that you can choose to marry but mm. she has to be handed over Jeez. into marriage so mm. like those experiences of women uh also understanding that even like political participation like for the longest time in history if you look at like the his like writings on leadership you're going to find mostly men once in a while especially with egyptian history like where there's cleopatra like you'll find women as like dots here and there but the vast majority of the narrative always involves men and so being able to see those experiences one How understand that history um angry for one that is um i like to joke about how i am a constantly enraged feminist but angry because many of these things border on life and death situations for women like whereas for some people it's narratives for women it's actually their lives right um sometimes it does make me feel hopeless because to imagine that people like professor sylvia tamale or dr hilda tadri and these are ugandan women have done the, did this work way before me i'm here in this struggle and i'm very likely to die and have and there are younger women who will be there continue to do this work while i'm here so it, it also gives a sense of hopelessness but on certain days i'm really happy because i don't exist in delusions around the world like i don't I unfortunately do I, I don't know if it's unfortunate but there are things that I see and I know them for what they are mm. I know how to navigate them for what they are but also I see a lot of women fighting for their very existence and fighting sometimes um at the cost of their lives but making the necessary important strides for women to be able to live dignified lives in the world so how about sdgs like sdg5 mm -hmm. do you feel it has it has performed to its duties so yes and no so the, so there are challenges um so i think what we've done quite well is the work around um, awareness raising like people being able to talk about gender-based violence people being able to talk about women's experiences for example with menstruation because those are conversations that were always like kept in the back of the house right so being able to have public platforms where people talk about these things has been very critical but in terms of achieving the social, political, and economic equality that I'm talking about, there's still a lot to be done. Because while we make, while we take three steps forward, there's always two steps back, or you're pushed back because of like a couple of things that people might say or do, or laws that are passed across the globe. Like now, you you see there is a there's a, there's a grand pushback mm. against, for example, sexual and reproductive health rights for women. Um, conversations around like Uganda has introduced um, this um, Honorable Saro Pendi has introduced a law against surrogacy and not to govern surrogacy but also assisted reproductive rights so mm. if I wanted to have a child then I cannot have a child unless I'm married married mm. yes 
are women all fully rooted into this movement? How is the circulation of uh, feminism in this country? So no, women are not fully rooted into this movement. I do know some people who don't want to identify as feminists, even while they are interested, for example, in equal rights. But also because historically, um, historically, we are products of a system. So because we're products of that system, we see life through a certain frame. So I'll give you the example of, um, what example can I use that's easy? So let me use the example of in a workplace. Mm. Like today you have quite a number of women in the workplace. It's not what we would like to see. Like we would like to see more women have the option of getting into workplaces. Mm. But when they get into these workplaces, they'll experience, for example, sexual harassment or they will have, um, even before they get into the workplace, someone will tell you, for you to be able to get a job, you have to sleep with me. Or even when they get into a workplace, you're either too young or you're too old, or sometimes your appearance is very important for the work. So if you're not like pretty enough for the job, mm. or women who lose their jobs because they've gotten pregnant and even the debates on maternity leave like in uganda people still say oh matern three months of maternity leave is a long time and yet women are doing like important high risk like work of have of, of of giving birth to children right and so in terms of and, and many people don't see this as a problem. So even when you talk about gender-based violence, often when people hear gender-based violence, all they think about is, oh, they have beaten you, right? Mm -hmm. And even when they have beaten you, someone will be quick to ask, why? what did you do to warrant this beating? As if on any day of the week, there is a reason to actually beat somebody. And some people don't even identify other forms of violence like emotional violence emotional mm. violence is where someone is constantly demeaning you with their words they are insulting you and it breaks you slowly like you don't see it like oh. you see alessi mm. when i hear you explain about feminism in mm. that context it gives me a clear definition mm -hmm. but not as perceived by the public yes and uh, many people wonder why do most men mm. perceive feminism as an attack to them well, technically, it is an attack on a system that gives men power. So if I attack the thing that gives you power, on certain days, like if you're going to fight a system, you're going to fight individuals while at it because systems don't exist in vacuums, right? They exist, people sustain them, people reinforce them. Now, the reason why very often men will feel like they are attacked is because like women are just having uncomfortable conversations because in the history of my life i have never seen a feminist come and physically beat a man simply for being a man but when women are raped if you look at the statistics the data of women who are raped they are raped by men and so if i'm going to talk about rape of women i'm going to talk about women being raped by men and so when you have that conversation even when women are talking about like times when they are exposed to danger a big chunk of the time it's going to be at the hands of a man and so when you're addressing violence against women of course you're going to address the perpetrators and who are the perpetrators they will the always men. be men now of course men are like oh not all of us but I'm going to use a beautiful example. I can't remember who used it, but it's not my own original example, so don't attri uh, attribute it to me. But this person said that when you see a snake, on no day of the week, do you wake up and wait and go and look at its head and say, hmm, it has a triangular head, therefore <laughs> it's poisonous. It has an oval head, therefore it's not, not poisonous. poisonous. You run, right? Mm -hmm. And so for us, given the statistics, given the experiences of women, mm -hmm. it is good for women to assume that they're not safe around men because if you don't assume that you don't engage you will engage very differently so that is our political positioning no we're not even attacking anyone so you see the you thing call, is from the beginning you called it a fight no it's, against the system yes it's and a fight uh, against the system mm. now part of that system like i said if you fight systems you're going to fight people in the process so if the people also don't see where you're coming from because if you look at gender-based violence data and i'm going to use this example like when men have daughters, mm. when men have women they like, mm. it is easy for them to say, you know, when I got a daughter, 
my perception of these things changed. changed. Mm. So do you see where we're coming from? So mm. it requires that I'm attached to a man who likes me for some semblance of safety. Mm. It never works out because you won't always be where your daughter is. Even the men who are abusing other people's children, mm. they possibly have daughters mm. whom they love very dearly and hold very dearly. And so there is, in the discussion around violence against women, there is need for behavior to change with mm. men. And that's why the conversation is looked at that way. And often the men who think they are being attacked, like, what are you running from? Like, what is it that you're running from that mm. you're feeling mm. attacked? Because if you're not doing these things, you're going to hear the conversation, appreciate where it's coming from and move on. Because they are men who over the time of doing the important work of learning and reading and observing their behavior, will see a certain conversation and know this is not addressing me and they will move. Do you feel convinced that uh, at least the fight is heading somewhere? Yes, I'm convinced the fight is heading somewhere because there are people who've come into this work after me. I didn't go and pull them and bring them in, right? Mm. They will read information. There are people who've reached out to me and said, hey, I'm curious about this and this and this. And this is both on the side of women and men, right? So we sit down and they'll ask, they'll be curious about certain things and talk about certain things. But even seeing women more publicly address some things for me, I think is very, very important because we've come from a place where women never addressed things like GBV publicly, mm. things like menstrual hygiene struggles publicly, but now they're addressing them publicly. So we're having this conversation so for me i think there is the fight is actually making progress so what do you see about the future of feminism in this country i think it's strong um of course i'm biased um i think it's strong i think there is um i think you you can never discount the experiences of the women who are going to live after me or who are living with me now and have not yet had certain experiences or come across certain um, information because sometimes you don't need an experience for you to be able to subscribe to something so i think for me it's strong just appreciating that there will always be pushback like no time in history has feminism ever been accepted like when you look at the women in the 30s in the 40s in the in the 60s like they experienced the same pushback that the women today are experiencing so for me I'm hopeful, mm. appreciating that there will be struggles in this work. I'm going to be asking some questions mm -hmm. that uh, I've had, read, and uh, I've seen from the public. As mm. being a journalist, I've consumed a lot of information mm -hmm. and a lot of questions have been raised. Mm. But this one is very profound. Mm. One, most men don't tend to associate with uh, women who call themselves the, who okay who don't call themselves but feminists mm. and uh many say i would not rather marry a feminist mm. when you hear things like that how do they make you feel like um i don't care <laughs> because honestly like why like why why is that the thing that i should be afraid of like what's like, what do I have to lose if you don't want to associate with me and marry me? I'm not looking for friendship from you. I'm looking, I'm fighting for my life and for my dignity, right? So even, and again, because men use those phrases because they know that women have been raised to aspire for marriage and therefore not getting married is a thing that some women are genuinely afraid of, right? But it's not something I exist with a fear of, right? So if a man doesn't want to exist with me or talk to me or associate with me because I'm a feminist, it's all good. I'm not breathing through your lungs. So like, I'm, it doesn't rattle me. You're married? No, I am not married. Are you going to consider to get married? Uh, I haven't thought about it very deeply. But, um, well, if it happens, well and good. If it doesn't, also well and good. Like, I'm not making any losses. Mm. as a staunch feminist mm. Mm? i don't know what's your view when you look at a male figure like for me it's like you're a person um it's also a bit of oops you could hurt me like okay yes oops you could hurt me i'm gonna like oops like the reality of being sexually so harassed or violated like yes yes because i don't know like who's going to be the good one and who's going to be the bad one so mm. it's safer you remember the analogy of the snake 
I'm not trying to find out whether you're poisonous or not. If in the end you don't turn out poisonous, well and good. Um, but it's not like it's not like the grandest aspiration. Yes. Is this something you'd wish the education systems should uh, bring on board? Yes, I think there is important room to talk about how relationships happen in society. Um, relationships including that appreciating that we're all equal beings wherever we are, mm. whether it's in the workplace, whether it is at home, um, whether it's in businesses, wherever it is that we meet, right, in public spaces. Um, also discussing issues around respecting people's personal space. Mm. Like as a woman, when you're walking down the street, you don't have that like you always exist knowing a border man could say size young someone in his car might stop down s- slow down and harass you and be like oh mm-hmm. i want to give you a lift and then you don't want them to give you a lift and then they cajole you or they or worst case scenario they even insult you because sometimes when you refuse to talk to them mm-hmm. they end up insulting you so there is a conversation to be had there mm-hmm. because these people don't behave like this out of the blue they see it they learn it mm-hmm. and then they leave it out because once and because also, also of, often there's no consequence like when i'm heckled at a border stage by border border men where do i go like if i go to police people are going to be like ah someone just shouted at you like get a life right but all the all that behavior exists on what we call the rape culture spectrum that people will heckle you people will try to coerce you into doing things like there's an entire spectrum i don't know if you are um, like paying attention the time when uganda passed what they call the anti-pornography bill yes. it's casually called the mini skirt bill what happened with that bill is men started addressing women downtown because they felt like their skirts were too short but on no day have women on the street tried to undress men for any whatsoever reason today you'll see men wearing short shorts moving around streets casually but nobody has ever tried to like to undress them mm. in the process but that is something that could potentially happen for women even as men like men fear each other because mm. if you were standing by your gate and you saw a group of men coming you're going to become a bit defensive like your safety wires are going to go up you go like who are these people where are they coming from because you're expecting a certain attack, attack from them and yet if you saw like a random group of like three four five girls you will assume all oh, these ones are gossiping they're going somewhere like your defense mechanism does not push you to think about them mm. as 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 like going to attack you and so the same thing happens for women and this comes from like the socialization that very often like society socializes men to think they are entitled to women's space so casual things like there are small things that are said like but you're never smiling like when men talk to you the simple example of the question that you asked me like what's my relationship with men Mm. um because you're, you're coming from certain assumptions right without knowing that yes i do actually have like quite a number of men in my life and so even so things like expecting politeness and warmness from women that if a man walked into a room and i'm completely unbothered by his existence it could be read as being rude as opposed to like i'm just not interested in your presence and it's okay like nothing about your life is going to reduce by me not being interested in your presence but As yes i think schools should take it on okay yes i do think media has given enough coverage to this movement i think they've done what they can but they can do better I think there's been they report stories they write um they will write about like the work of the movement uh, mostly especially like around like women's day or now in a season that we call the 16 days of activism mm. against um to end violence against women and girls but in terms of but I want to focus more on the media's mainstream reporting like media often trivializes a lot of experiences of women so a girl a 16 year old girl is raped by her teacher and they will write a story like teacher punished or or girl reports man to police for asking for sex like trivializing the concept of rape Mm. and moving it into just like a small casual discussion and so media has so much better to report you even see the way like during elections media will be interested more in that's the small things about like women who are running for political office as opposed to the issues that they're raising they'll write an article like who was the smartest woman on the campaign on the campaign trail mm. no one is running an article about who was the smartest man on the campaign trail mm. um you will like women's sex lives are more covered like in the sense of if someone's um 
uh, say let me say like if someone made like a a sex video like a, a sex tape sorry if someone made a sex tape and it mm. leaks it takes like when it's from women it takes a lot of um time and people are analyzing you and saying all these things mm. and then media covers it in such a way as to blame the woman for what has happened or even when women um experience violence there's always that discussion around what has she done and so i think the media can do well mm. in the way they position their language but even the way they cover women generally like today it's easy to turn on tv mm. and see like six men talking about issues in uganda like there are no women in this country to talk about those like to who, who actually know what's happening mm. and contribute to that so they can do better so what are some of the positive impacts mm. that uh, you have created in your movement one access to education today if you look at the statistics for primary school uh you actually have more girls than boys in school although we still have a problem of raping of children who then become pregnant what they call teenage pregnancy when you look at if you look at the uganda bureau of statistics data on um retention in school or school dropout you realize that boys and girls fall out for the same reasons except for girls have teenage pregnancy as the reason why they fall out there have also been important laws that have been passed um, around uh, gender-based violence the succession act is also very important because it has recognized certain important things within relations between men and women especially where family is involved uh, the women's rights movement has also been very critical in bringing uh, difficult conversations to the surface. One of the biggest debates that has happened in the last couple of days is the one on marital rape. People don't believe that women in marriage can get raped, and yet they actually can. People assume marriage is a blanket consent. Mm. So um, even women in public spaces, of course, women in public spaces does not automatically translate into into the issues of women being addressed because women have every right mm. equal to men to be bad leaders often women are expected to be better leaders which is not the case um, but representation is important because if people are members of society they should be able to be represented in the public affairs of that society yes wow interesting oh and also a lot do of work around sexual reproductive health rights do you have any regrets no i have none Okay, maybe the regret that I have is sometimes I wish I didn't know what I knew. Because the saying that ignorance is bliss, mm. sometimes I want to just walk through life without seeing and noticing certain things that other people think are normal and expected in society. But in terms of the work that I've done and the work that I continue to do, I don't have any regrets. I really don't. Yes. So what are some of the activities you're working on for now? For now... Um, I'm not going to say that I'm working on them because working on them makes it seem like work, mm. like everyday jobs. But I do a lot of important work in teaching women about transformation of feminist leadership. Transformation of feminist leadership is a form of leadership that looks at power dynamics in society and seeks to create um, healthy relationships. So whether it's at the workplace, in the family, how do we exercise power in such a way that we create healthy environments for everyone. So how do you be a boss? Does being a boss mean shouting at people, bullying them around? Mm. How do we take into consideration the unique needs of people? If um, if a man and his wife or if a couple has had a baby, how do I engage with that in the workplace? How do I ensure that I'm creating an environment where parents can be supportive to each other during that season? How do we create a work environment where people's labor rights are actually respected without even the presence of a law? Because often people need a law to be present for them to do the right thing. Mm. And for us, the aspiration is that how do we create a, a work environment, life generally, where we center the wellness of people? Because in feminism, the wellness of individuals is very important, important. to us. Mm. Um, I also do a lot of support to, not a lot, like I do support um, small, like people who are like doing small non-profits, mm. uh, NGOs, to sometimes think about their systems and structures. Um, I also actively, I'm the kind of person, if your husband is beating you, please don't call me when you when you want an intervention. I'm collecting mm. you from this marriage because mm. you're going to die mm. and I don't know what it is that we are trying to fix. So for me... Have you done that before? 
Oh yes. Has I anyone have. ever called you yes. for that? Yes. How was it? Um, it's always traumatizing. It's mm. always difficult, but also appreciating the complexity of abuse. No, how did you approach it? How do I approach it? How did it? you approach How that did I particular appro- incident? Yes, that particular incident. Oh no, first and foremost, I asked her if she wanted to leave and she said no. Um, so I asked her if, you, if she wanted her, me to address her husband about it. She said no, but I made it clear mm. to the man that I don't like you and I don't want you to you did engage. just storm into their house? Yes. No, I can't storm into someone's house. I have respect for privacy mm-hmm. as well, but also have respect for people. Like one of the things that we learn in feminist work is that we don't want to do more harm because we've learned from engaging with uh, gender-based violence victims that sometimes when you engage, then the partner retaliates on them. And so you're trying to create a safe environment as much as possible. So when she was ready, we escorted her to police, me and a couple of friends, we escorted her to police, she reported. We, um, In those circumstances, I also give women money because mm. very often many of these women will call you and say, I'm suffering, but I don't even know how to live. I don't have money because mm. this person has refused me to work. I have no problem sending them money because this is part of my duty as a feminist. And this is not even part of my eight to five job because my eight to five job does not involve these things. Like my so eight now, to five uh, let job. Me get to, <laughs> let me get to understand the other yes. side of your mm. uh, uh, You sound like an activist and I'm sure some people have I've called you out as an activist. Yes, I am an activist. And activism is something that you cannot do alone. Yes. Who's you giving you a helping hand? Um, I have a community of sisters. I have a community of sisters. Um, again, feminism is rooted in community. Feminism, like if you're doing feminism as an individual, mm. I don't know what you're doing. But a key tenant of feminism is community. Sisterhood is what we call it. So I have a group of sisters. I know exactly who to call when something happens. Mm-hmm. I know who to go and cry to because we have a support system for each other. Mm. I, if I got arrested now, I know which people are going to bring me food who are not even my family members because I have built a community. So in, in our activism work, we build community with each other. We support each other. I also know friends who call me and say, let's go and deal with this person. Mm. And I will be there without asking any questions because <laughs> I trust and I know that their intentions are pure. So you're yes. this person like her man alessi who do we my husband to? is misbehaving what <laughs> yes like provided you give me consent to intervene mm-hmm. i'm coming into that thing but of course there's a line like mm-hmm. there are certain people who you will see mm. are refusing intervention but if you don't remove them mm. from that space they are not going to be okay mm-hmm. so sometimes i've not done it before but sometimes we're going to remove people and be like listen it's in your interest that you stay alive. Are there men who look at you like you're fierce uh, I like to think so, and it brings me such joy because my goal really? is to be feared. I want men to fear me. Why? Yes. Why? Because it changes the way they interact with you. Mm-hmm. It changes the level of nonsense that comes to you. Mm-hmm. Yes, because from that Why time... Why nonsense? Because, like, people know that when I'm in a space, and mm. it's a good thing and bad thing, because I know that I've missed out on opportunities because people are like, ah... If we bring Alessi into this thing, it, yes, and and I'm I'm happy with it because for mm. me it shows me that people know my principles. Mm. They know the lines they don't cross with me, mm. and yet there are people who want me in mm. spaces for the same reasons that people don't want me in those spaces. Is that what you wish for every girl? I think it's a, what I wish for every woman that people, when people cross you, they should cross you with respect. That they, when they come to you, the young people say, "If you're going to come to me, come correct." Mm. So you need to come correct. And I think, like for me, that's come put. Yes, come put. So mm. it it sieves. Like for mm. me, the thing it has genuinely done for me okay. is it has sieved the people in my life. Mm-hmm. Like has my, it took just men away from you? Like I told you earlier, that is the least of my fears. That is the like chasing men out of my life is the least of my. Are you fears. dating? Um, that's personal information that I'm not <laughs> going to delve on this show. <laughs> Alessi, there's something I'm curious to understand. Yes. I want to pick your mind about uh-huh. it. When you hear that a woman has beaten a man, mm. you've heard about these cases, right? Yes. What comes into your mind? So, ah, let me say this. Because often, and I'm only going to answer it because um, I believe that there's space for people to, like, be educated and learn right so for the audience specifically so violence against men does happen 
violence against men does happen like if um one in domestic spaces but if you look at data and statistics if you pay there's an organization called refugee law project they did a study on men who had experienced sexual violence at mm. the hands of men during wars mm. and it's so heartbreaking interestingly feminists have also written on if you read the works of like for example someone like bell hooks she's a feminist author she's written on the suffering of men and how society has taken away from men the need to the, the ability to be people whether it's to cry so like when you're young and you mm. cry as a boy they say why are you crying as a boy mm. but the expression of import of, of emotions is very important for human existence mm. so yes when a man is beaten I treat it as gender-based violence because gender-based violence is not violence against women and girls. Mm. Gender-based violence includes everybody who experiences this violence. The challenge that I have as a woman I'm fighting for my life. Mm. I don't have the time to fight for the lives of men. So my call to men is when men experience violence, speak up. Mm. The times when I remember there's a Kenyan man whose name I cannot remember who talked about his experience with rape and if you went in the comments it was men mm. who were laughing at him who were ridiculing him and so like if you yourselves cannot organize because the reason why there's a feminist movement the reason why there's a lot of conversation on gender based violence is because women have organized themselves I'm asking this with uh, a lot of care. Mm, no, ask your questions. <laughs> today, like today, I'm in teaching spirit. You're in teaching spirit. Yes. <laughs> when you hear that uh, a man's ego has been suppressed down mm. to the extent that we have so many young men carrying broken hearts, but I heard you, I heard you speak that men are unable to speak out. We have so many men carrying broken hearts mm. in the apartments. Mm. They cannot speak up, mm. but a woman is involved. Don't you think it's the right time that now we started changing or balancing the communication or the conversation about gender-based violence? Um, like, um, I think my question is always, who has refused men to speak up, right? Mm. Because, again, the reason why you think that there's more conversation around women is precisely because women chose to die to that shame mm. and speak up. Mm. So my call is to men to get up because as a woman I cannot speak to your experience. How I experience the world is not the same way as men experience the world, right? So I'm calling on men to speak up because there are men who've started these conversations and unfortunately often they are ridiculed. It is the very same men who be like, like, what kind of man are you? You need to be strong and tough and get through this thing. Mm. If you've been heartbroken, go to the gym and exercise. And that is how social norms are. Yes, and so you see, for example, suicide rates are much higher in men than women. If today I went through a breakup, I'm going to collect my sisters and we're going to sit in a room and we're going to cry and we might even abuse you like now everyone knows everything they didn't like about you to comfort me mm. so i have outlets but men when something happens you sit in your corner and you're silent mm. right on top of the fact that men have also like because of the socialization and this is the system feminists are saying let's break the socialization where your entire identity as men is the money you make so if you don't have money, you become the most problematic people in the world. You are so grumpy. And you know, there's a saying on Twitter, like no one likes rich men more than men. Like mm. men really like rich men. And so those identity brackets that take away your ability to be human beings, that you live in Uganda, of course someone is going to be broke. Mm. Like unfortunately, because of where you're geographically located, mm. someone is going to be broke. Mm. And so... In understanding that is where men must start to share their experiences about life, right? Mm. About the world. If this experience involves women, there is room for accountability. What is the need for changed behavior? But we must be careful because often when men are discussing issues of changed behavior in women, mm. what they are telling women is we expect you to reduce yourselves so that we shine the way we want to shine. Mm. And yet accountability doesn't look like that. Accountability is saying you're equal to me, but this one thing you're doing is causing me harm. But often men, it's always a thing of, but me, I want to be treated a certain way. Respect looks like a certain way for me. Who said women don't like to be respected? Me, I like to be respected. But it sounds like feminism is against culture. What is your view about it? Feminism is against any culture that creates 
sub 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 uh, that creates sub citizens like pe- that reduces people i have no problem with kindness because kindness is part of our african culture like as a collective as people like being kind our ubuntu nature and if you look at feminist literature african feminist work i invite people to read um work by people like professor sylvia tamale who have written vastly around african feminism they talk about ubuntu how do we care for each other how do we care for the environment these are important aspects but very often when we talk about culture do you know what people run to oh if she's not kneeling for me women must stay at home and cook has food ever refused to be eaten because it came from Serena? Why no, eat? you eat it. <laughs> it is all, they're all sweet potatoes. Yes. So let's be clear. And besides, things mm-hmm. like, often the things that are written out as culture are actually just normal human behavior. Like, cooking is, an, is a human skill. Mm. It's not given to one group of people. So if you're going to bring cultural practices that reduce one person mm. and elevate another of course we are going to fight it because mm. our goal is to create a society where people are equal. are equal and let me just make it clear because every time when you talk about equal people go and start saying but men cannot give birth we are not talking about biological changes mm. we are talking about if i walk into a room i am a person like you yes i will get pregnant and give birth something you cannot do but if i give birth things like bathing a child these are land behaviors people should be able to care for their families equally you shouldn't think you know these statements like oh if my wife asks me to do something with my partner like are we equal people mm. so that's what we are moving so i don't want anyone to come into the comments and start oh but biology no this is not a discussion of biology this is a discussion of human relations mm. yes and how does religion play in in uh, feminism hmm after this they're going to chase me from that church <laughs> but, <laughs> but let me say this so the truth is um one feminism is a secular um school of thought right and feminism will be at loggerheads with a lot of religious views over time like even in christianity the discussion around submission because from our experience and what we've seen in the world as feminists is submission is always used to take voice and agency voice is the ability of women to speak up against things that that um, that affect them agency is their desire to push back against these things so it takes away that the personhood of women that's how submission is always often used Mm. christians will have these debates and people are going to definitely disagree with me that oh no that's not what submission means it's taught differently over what the bible meant different things but that's a discussion for another day i'm seeing what is happening right in front of me uh when you look at um whether it's um islam um there are ways in which women are treated that we don't entirely like appreciate Mm. but we also will not like be like i'm not going to come at muslim women because i'm not a muslim woman so i will not be able to speak eloquently to islam but they will always be a loggerhead so you will the people who hate feminism the most are religious leaders they yes they they because they feel like we're upsetting the world order of things mm-hmm. like we are saying oh we why what are you saying about equality the man was created to be the leader and the woman over the head and, and then the you woman sub, over what 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 no religion? yes i do i'm a christian you're going yes. to look into this camera uh-huh <laughs> and, and so uh, i want you to speak to one mm-hmm. to the men mm-hmm. your message to the men mm-hmm. and uh a message to the women mm. so i'm going to start with the women um you're full human beings like don't ever on any day think that you're less than simply because you're a woman like society has taught us to want only very specific things out of life but it's good to aspire for more this more does not inc- does not mean working yourself to the bone and suffering and dying in the process but see yourself fully as a human being and when you're making the choices that you're making make sure you're making them as a full human being but i also invite you to read more about feminism um not to just listen to street gossip and all these conversations on the internet make it a point to actually go into primary sources i'm going to say names like audrey lord i'm going to say names like bell hooks i'm going to say names like sylvia tamale these women have written uh, enough for us to be able to learn certain things to the men you need to aspire to do better 
by women but also you need to aspire to do better by yourselves very often men have felt like all oh, women aren't addressing the things that affect us nobody is going to address the things that affect you except yourself so you have to get out of your pride your imaginary big egos and appreciate that your people suicide rates are higher in men uh, mental health is on the rise among men and it's because you're not doing the important work of building community with each other so have build relationships where you can actually be vulnerable and be people to each other so that we all exist in a world where we are kind to each other thank wow. you that's the end of a live with simon chris makanga thank you so much for the comments and the likes and also go ahead and subscribe it won't steal your thunder. Until next time, bye-bye.